The train emitted a loud sound and lurched forward. Outside the window, fields, meadows, and lakes flickered by. For nearly 20 years, Catherine had observed this landscape almost daily. In half an hour, she would arrive at the station, pass three more bus stops from there, and find herself in the center providing assistance to people in difficult life situations. That's where she worked as a nurse. She was 44 years old now, but she still fondly remembered her time studying at medical university and their close-knit group. Among the 23 girls in their cohort, there were only two guys. The guys were very different, but their active stance, love for medicine, and good sense of humor united the young students during and after classes. Catherine still often looked through photo albums from past years. Unfortunately, over time, their communication had been severed forever. Catherine liked her profession, although working in the medical center was challenging, and the clientele was specific. Employees didn't stay here for long. After a few months, most would quit, but Catherine wasn't deterred by the difficulties. To her, all the patients were simply people who had fallen on hard times. They ended up here for various reasons, due to housing or document loss, returning from incarceration, or being ill without means for treatment. The only thing uniting them was that they had no one else to turn to for help. Catherine never judged anyone. Of course, she couldn't replace their families, but she was always ready to listen, help, and support with useful advice. Her patients reciprocated and always eagerly awaited her assistance. Right now, the lively Jane would be the first to approach her, demanding her blood pressure be taken, complaining she hadn't slept all night. The pressure would probably be normal, but Catherine understood that the elderly woman simply needed companionship, and she would definitely sympathize with her. Then she would need to carry out the doctor's appointments for the sick, allocate time properly to make sure it was enough for everyone. At home in the village, she had a small farm, a few dozen chickens, and a red cow. Only one thing had been troubling Catherine lately. Her daughter, Sheila, was about to marry into a very wealthy family. Catherine had only seen them once, but that was enough. She had never encountered such arrogance in her life. Her daughter was already ashamed of her background, and now this family had humiliated her even more by agreeing to their main condition, not to invite her own mother to her own wedding. Fear of her future-in-laws completely paralyzed her will. Stuttering and embarrassed, Sheila voiced her fiancé's parents' demand to her mother. It hurt Catherine deeply. Who were these prospective in-laws? But looking into her daughter's happy, loving eyes, she didn't show how hurt she was. Today happened to be the day of their wedding. She hadn't even noticed she had reached the stop. Silver-haired Jane, leaning on her cane, was already standing by the door. Seeing her favorite nurse, she smiled widely. Catherine, hello, I've been waiting for you. Time flew by at work, and only by noon was she distracted from her duties by a phone call. Seeing my dear on the screen, Catherine smiled, feeling light-hearted. So, Sheila hadn't forgotten about her. She wanted to share her joy. Sheila's fiancé came from a famous aristocratic family. His parents were proud of their lineage considered themselves superior to others, and reacted sensitively to any disrespectful gesture towards them. Their successful construction business further distanced them from ordinary citizens. Their only son never lacked anything but was completely dependent on his wealthy parents. Sheila, on the other hand, grew up in a modest family and from childhood remembered how hard it was for her mother. After graduating from university, Catherine got a job as a nurse in the neurology department. She was good at giving injections and setting up four drips. The patients adored the young nurse, who administered injections painlessly and listened to them attentively. It was there that she met her future husband, a short, fair-haired guy who worked as a carpenter, but was very proud of his profession. Most people don't understand that it's a creative job. Wood is a living material with its own mood and energy. Ryan would say with admiration, Catherine liked the young man's enthusiasm for his work. He stood out from many other workers, 
He didn't drink alcohol at all, didn't curse, and loved to read books. His huge blue eyes made him look like an angel. But despite his attractive appearance, he was very shy around girls. With Catherine, things just clicked from the first meeting. Their communication was easy and relaxed. Whenever they had free time, they would sit together and talk about everything. Their first kiss opened the door to a magical world of love for them and gave them the confidence that they were made for each other. Ryan ended up in the hospital because of frequent dizziness and muscle spasms. He didn't pay attention to the alarming symptoms until one day he passed out right at work. The diagnosis was unexpected and frightening. Ryan slumped and stopped coming to Catherine, and then he discharged himself from the hospital and disappeared altogether. She had a hunch about what was happening with the young man. Without hesitation, she went to his dormitory herself. Seeing the girl, Ryan paled. Joy and fear mingled in his soul. Trying to suppress his emotions, he averted his gaze from her, which could betray his feelings. Ryan, where have you been? Why haven't you come? Catherine's voice trembled, tears glistening in her eyes. The young man hung his head and sadly examined his shoes. Catherine, this has nothing to do with you. I've been diagnosed with an incurable disease. He said, each word difficult to utter due to tension in his throat. I know everything. She said, why don't you come to me? Ryan sighed deeply. I'm practically disabled. With this diagnosis, people don't live long. I don't want you to be unhappy. He said, a wave of deep tenderness rose in Catherine's heart, compelling her to stride impulsively towards him. She approached very close, holding her breath, and looked into his sad eyes, then kissed him first on the forehead, and then on the lips. I love you. I need you in joy and in sorrow. Remember this, please, forever. And let's never bring up this issue again. The girl's words were so filled with warmth and sincerity that they convinced Ryan. Everything that had been accumulating in his soul lately burst out with a loud exhale and a couple of reserved tears. He grabbed the girl and hugged her with both strength and tenderness at the same time. Soon they got married and moved to a village where Ryan had an old house inherited from his parents. Catherine had never lived in a private house before. She eagerly embraced the new way of life, spending time in the garden with enthusiasm, raising a few chickens. A ginger puppy now ran after her in the yard and a green-eyed cat named Ollie lived in the house. They lived in harmony with her husband. He literally worshipped her. Ryan had to apply for disability benefits, but he didn't intend to just sit idle. He worked as a carpenter or helped people with minor repairs. In his free time, he would fix up their own home. There was always work to be done in a private house. He loved crafting various wooden items. In Catherine's kitchen, there were elegant stools and cutting boards with incredible patterns on the back. Then their daughter Sheila was born. Ryan was incredibly happy. He sang lullabies to the baby, got up at night to feed her from the bottle. Although he and his wife no longer discussed his disability's future, he still lived each day as if it were one of the last, trying to savor every moment. That's why he was delighted to hold his little daughter, to look into her blue eyes, which were absolutely identical to his own. The first step, the first word, everything seemed like a miraculous wonder. Sheila reciprocated his love, and as she grew up, she never left her dad's side. He called her his princess, told her bedtime stories about castles and knights, and promised that magic would happen in her life. Over time, Ryan's illness began to progress. He couldn't work anymore, and the small disability payments weren't enough even for basic needs. It was then that Catherine took a job at the assistance center. Getting to work wasn't very convenient for her, but Catherine didn't complain. Knowing that her clients always eagerly awaited her, she got used to the challenging rhythm of her life. Ryan's condition worsened, and soon he lost the ability to move and speak. Catherine jiggled between her husband, confined to bed, household chores, and work. By that time, Sheila was 14 years old. 
She always tried to help her mother around the house, and now she took on most of the care for her sick father. Catherine taught her daughter how to give therapeutic massages and persistently asked her not to show Ryan any pity, but to treat her father just as before. They always talked to him naturally, telling him about their day, joking. The man thanked them with his loving gaze, unable to speak, and then Ryan was gone. Catherine silently mourned, but pain settled in her soul forever. Her mind had long been prepared for this loss, but her soul couldn't come to terms with it. Relief only came when she mentally thanked her late husband for the happy 15 years of their life together, for their daughter, for true love. Sheila took his loss very hard. For her, her father was a whole world, and now he was gone. For several days after the funeral, she hardly left her room, and when she finally emerged with a swollen face from tears, she already knew for sure that as soon as she finished school, she would leave this village, which brought her painful memories. She decided to enroll in medical school and become a rehabilitation doctor in memory of her dad. The determined girl constantly studied textbooks on core subjects and medical literature. However, she couldn't get into university. Not finding herself on the list of accepted students, she was deeply disappointed. She decided that she would try again next year. She had no intention of returning to the village. The prospect of working on a farm didn't appeal to her. She rented a room with her friend Frances and started looking for a job. To get closer to her dream, Sheila got a job as a nurse's aide in the clinical ward of a hospital. It was a chance to see the entire process of treatment and recovery from the inside. Soon, her inquisitive and resourceful nature caught attention. She was taken along to particularly interesting surgeries and entrusted with simple medical procedures. Sheila spent every evening with textbooks, endlessly reviewing and refreshing her memory with all the material so as not to repeat the mistakes of the past year. Occasionally, on weekends, she visited her mother. Catherine was sad and lonely, left alone. Work and household chores, that was now her entire lot. Sheila's neighbor, Frances, on the other hand, led a busy and fun life. She disappeared into nightclubs and parties, fell in love with guys, and broke up with them. She constantly told Sheila that youth only comes once, and it shouldn't be wasted on boring studies. Six months passed. The upcoming exams no longer scared Sheila so much. Hard work and perseverance gave her a certain confidence. She wanted to relax a little and relieve the tension of the past few months. Can I go to the party with you? She unexpectedly asked her neighbor, seeing that she was getting ready to go somewhere. Frances was very excited and began to get her friend ready for the nightclub. Soon, in the reflection of the mirror, Sheila saw a glamorous, slender girl with a provocative look. She felt uncomfortable in this outfit but her experienced friend insisted that now Sheila looked like a normal person. At the club, the girl felt uncomfortable at first, but soon she even liked the atmosphere. Active Frances went from one group to another, leaving her friend at the bar with a cocktail in hand. A tall, handsome brunette approached her. They started talking gradually. The guy's name was Patrick. He was in his fourth year of studying economics. The young man impressed the girl with his manners and erudition. He could easily hold a conversation on any topic, even such boring ones as politics and economics. She found it very interesting, despite having to constantly shout over the loud music. Soon, an excited Frances approached them and took her friend away. You already met Patrick? She asked Sheila in surprise. Sheila nodded shyly, eager to learn more about her new acquaintance. Do you know him? She asked Francis. Francis shrugged. He's just a rich kid. Honestly, he's pretty boring. Sheila chose to ignore such comments. What did this frivolous Francis understand anyway? At the end of the evening, Patrick held a taxi for the girls. They agreed to meet in the park the next day. Sheila's heart beat joyfully in anticipation of something happy and new. In the daylight, Sheila liked Patrick even more. Something elusive in his appearance or behavior reminded her of her father, and she took it as a sign from above. Now that nothing stood in the way of their communication, 
the young man didn't stop talking, telling her about his studies and the countries he had visited. The girl, unable to take her admiring eyes off him, listened attentively. After all, she had nothing to tell him. Such attention flattered and inspired the guy to act. The first touch, the first embrace, and the first tender kiss. Sheila felt like the happiest person. She couldn't believe that such a handsome, smart, and educated guy could be interested in someone like her. Her whole world centered around the only man who filled the void in her soul after losing her beloved father. Just a month later, Sheila found out she was pregnant. The bewildered girl immediately told Patrick the news. He scratched his head thoughtfully and pondered. Didn't expect this to happen so soon. Sheila, holding her breath, watched his reaction, trying to understand if he was happy or not. Finally, he took full responsibility and got down on one knee. I love you. Marry me. The girl, closing her eyes with happiness, hugged Patrick tightly. Events unfolded very quickly, perhaps too quickly. Sheila introduced her future husband to her mother. Catherine didn't show that she didn't like this guy at all. However, the news that she would soon become a grandmother thrilled her immensely. It seemed that everything was fine. All that remained was to introduce Sheila to Patrick's parents. However, he omitted the fact that they had long since chosen a bride for him, their business partner's daughter. Fortunately, this bold girl didn't appeal to him at all. On the appointed day, Sally, the young man's mother, eagerly awaited the meeting with her son's future wife. She hoped that her son's choice would surpass the one they had made with his father. However, when a short girl in a modest dress and cheap, long out of fashion shoes entered their house, the woman was shocked. The girl didn't appeal to her at first sight. Sheila instantly felt that she didn't like her fiancé's mother and was very embarrassed. The woman, first and foremost, haughtily inquired about the girl's parents and what they did. Upon hearing the answer, she smirked and began a long narrative about their aristocratic origins. My son has noble blood flowing through his veins, and he is obligated to preserve and pass on these valuable genes to his children, she said, hypnotizing the girl with a guise full of contempt. Learning that Sheila had failed her exams last year, she pondered for a long time about her son's achievements and intellectual abilities. The tea party seemed like a real torture to Sheila. The girl was completely lost and didn't know how to behave, what to say, so as not to embarrass herself completely. She was even afraid to touch the delicate teacup made of antique Chinese porcelain. Therefore, she was relieved when her fiancé offered to call a taxi for her. As soon as Sheila left, Sally started scolding her son. Patrick, have you gone mad? It's one thing, a passing fancy. But another thing is marriage. She's not suitable for you at all. Where did you find her? The woman walked excitedly around the room, desperately gesturing with her hands. Her mother is just a nurse. We don't need such relatives. Horrible. Mom. But we love each other, and we're having a baby. Patrick weakly tried to convince her. The woman raised her voice. We still need to figure out whose baby it is. I know people like her. They sleep with anyone, and then marry a fool like you. And that's it. Her life is set. Patrick pondered. Honestly, he didn't really want to take on such responsibility himself. And if his mother got really angry, she might stop giving him money. Seeing her son's doubts, Sally continued, but more gently. Now Rose is a different story. She's tall, stately, and her parents are so respected. You've liked her for a long time. Patrick was embarrassed. She looks like a toad and clearly lacks intelligence. I'm against it. The mother exclaimed again in indignation. What do you understand? But her father has money and connections. You know, our company depends directly on his orders. He promised that if you marry Rose, he will fully support both your children and grandchildren. And if you marry Sheila, your father and I won't help you. Well, I don't know. The boy said hesitantly. Sheila and I have already made up our minds. Your father and I will help you. And so, the day arrived. 
Happy Sheila and Francis, as a witness, arrived half an hour early for the wedding registration. Sheila, dressed up and cheerful, stood at the threshold of the wedding palace, scanning the surroundings for her groom. A week ago, ignoring Francis's comments that the groom should pay for everything, she bought simple white shoes and a modest dress at a discount, which perfectly hugged her petite figure. They had agreed to meet Patrick right here, but her groom was still nowhere to be seen. There were only five minutes left before the start of the marriage registration. Francis asked with doubt, are you sure he's coming? Of course, he's just running a little late. The bride justified confidently. Nearly an hour passed, but Patrick still hadn't shown up. Oh God, what if something happened? Sheila nervously fretted. Finally, she gathered her courage and dialed his phone number. In response, she heard a female voice. Sheila immediately recognized her future mother-in-law. Stop calling him, she said rudely, then haughtily continued. Patrick doesn't want to talk to you. He loves another girl and just married her, so don't call he again. Sheila's breath caught sharply. Her hands trembled, and she almost dropped her phone. What a jerk. Francis cursed. Overhearing their entire conversation, Sheila helplessly sat down right on the steps, clutching her head in her hands. There was only one question in her mind. How could he do this to her? Francis ran around Sheila, trying to save the remnants of her makeup and wedding dress from her tears. But Sheila didn't care anymore. Her hand reached for the phone on its own. Catherine eagerly grabbed her phone, preparing beautiful words to congratulate her beloved daughter. Mom! Sheila, through tears, couldn't explain anything properly. From her disjointed phrases, Catherine finally pieced together the whole picture, but she couldn't believe it. God, can people really do this? Sheila, wait for me there. I'm coming now, her mother said firmly. It was almost dark already. The bride sat in the park, her friend Frances beside her, not knowing how to help Sheila. The sight of Sheila made her heart ache, but there was neither time nor strength for sentimentality. Which restaurant were they planning to celebrate in? Let's go there, Catherine decisively said, taking her daughter's hand and leading her to a taxi. Catherine confidently pushed open the massive door of the upscale restaurant and stepped into the spacious hall. The walls and columns were adorned with countless white roses. Guests in extravagant attire danced joyfully in the middle of the room. The hum of voices, resembling the buzz of a beehive, drowned out the soft background music. A pleasant scent of expensive perfume lingered in the air. The sternly dressed hostess greeted the guests with an unruffled demeanor and inquired if they were on the guest list. Of course, Catherine immediately responded and hurriedly made her way inside, scanning the room for the newlyweds. She dragged poor Sheila along, ignoring her protests. At the main table, literally engulfed in floral decorations, sat the celebrants, the statuesque brunette bride, in an elegant wedding gown adorned with delicate lace and beads, raised her eyebrows and warmly smiled, mistaking the entering guests for distant relatives. Patrick immediately realized that a dreadful scandal was imminent. He paled and jumped up in fear from his seat. Sheila couldn't bear to look at this vile family anymore. She couldn't take it and fled outside. The situation was only getting worse. Unexpectedly, Catherine walked past this group straight to the stage. She said something to the event host and took the microphone into her hands. She already knew what she was going to do. Dear guests, I congratulate the newlyweds on this solemn day. And as a congratulatory gesture, I want to share an instructive story with you." Her voice surprisingly calm. Some guests smiled and relaxed, thinking it was planned by the organizers. Only the groom's mother frantically looked for security. There is a kind girl, and one day she met a noble prince. He promised her a fairy tale life, and the girl believed him. But eventually, the prince turned out to be a common scoundrel. With these words, she disdainfully glanced at Patrick. I congratulate the charming bride on becoming part of a family unfamiliar with concepts like decency, honor, and conscience. 
who scheduled two weddings simultaneously and made this cynical choice in favor of the wealthier bride. I also congratulate her on marrying a creature I can't even call a manual. He abandoned his pregnant bride right before the wedding ceremony. Noticing that two huge men in identical formal suits were approaching her, she finished her speech with, Live happily if you can, with these words. She handed the microphone back to the host and, with her head held high, left the hall amidst silence. Catherine left the restaurant. She clearly felt relieved. She looked around for her daughter. Sheila was sitting nearby. The girl had sunk into extreme apathy and just stared blankly ahead. Nothing else mattered to her anymore. Today she experienced the most humiliating day of her life. Catherine sat down next to her daughter and silently embraced her. Words were unnecessary here. Cars passed by them. Suddenly, a huge car abruptly stopped. A middle-aged man jumped out of the car and waved to Catherine and Sheila. Catherine even glanced back to make sure the welcoming gesture was indeed for them. The man, seeing their confusion, approached and smiled broadly. Catherine, hello, don't you recognize me? She still looked at the stranger with a short haircut and gray hair the temples in pizzolment. Those gray eyes seemed familiar to her. I'm Keith. We were in the same group at school. Keith, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you. Catherine smiled. Is this your daughter? He gestured at Sheila, but said nothing aloud about her condition. Yes, Catherine was embarrassed. She didn't want to delve into the details of their terrible situation right now. Her old acquaintance understood everything and didn't ask unnecessary questions. Let's go to the car. I'll give you a ride. He offered. Thank you, Keith. But we lie far from here. Catherine felt uncomfortable imposing on the manual. That's great. Then we'll have more time to catch up. He said. Throughout the journey to the settlement, Keith talked about himself. After graduating from university, he worked in his field for about a year and realized it wasn't his path. He enrolled in another university and became a veterinarian. During his studies, he got married. He and his wife lived in love and harmony, but they didn't have children, so they decided to adopt. With the arrival of little Greg, their home was filled with a special atmosphere of comfort and joy. After university, Keith was offered a job at a horse farm. Unfortunately, a few years later, the owner of the farm passed away and there was no one to continue the family business. Keith found it hard to see the business on the brink of bankruptcy. Eventually, the owner's widow decided to sell the farm and Keith managed to buy it for a small sum of money. Soon, business was thriving again. Keith's son grew up and happily helped his father. Eventually, he fell in love with a girl, and they got married. However, last year, Keith's wife and Greg were returning from another city when they got into an accident. The woman died on the spot, and the boy sustained a severe injury. His fiancé broke up with him right in the hospital ward. Greg fell into a severe depression. He doesn't believe in recovery and doesn't want to live. His muscles atrophied. Despite a successful operation, he can't stand up. He needs extensive rehabilitation. Keith invited specialists, but no one can reach an agreement with him. Catherine, maybe you could stay at my house and take care of him. I remember you were good at it. Keith asked hopefully. Keith, I can't. I'm very needed at work. They can't do without me there. And I can't abandon my household. She replied regretfully. But then a sudden crazy thought came to her mind. If you want, you can hire my daughter for work. I've taught her a lot, and she wants to become a doctor in this field. Keith paused for a moment and nodded approvingly. In desperation, he was ready for any option. Knowing you, I have no doubt about your daughter. He couldn't help but compliment. Catherine didn't even have to persuade Sheila. She was glad to change the scenery and forget at least for a while, all the troubles. The next day, Sheila arrived at the enormous house where she was going to work. The mansion impressed her with its size and unique atmosphere. It seemed to be assembled from small details that created comfort and mood. Colorful pillows on the couch, 
light curtains arranged in a special way, numerous paintings and photographs in frames. Keith led her to his son's bedroom. He lay facing the wall, seemingly asleep. Son, this is Sheila. She's a medic and will help you recover. Keith introduced her. Greg turned to them. Aggression evident in his guise. Who is this Sheila? I said I don't need anything. He said, turning away again. Keith sighed sadly, then suddenly winked at the girl. Sheila, I trust you. If he doesn't want to cooperate, you can handle this lazy bones as you see fit. At your discretion. The main thing is the result. Sheila smiled awkwardly in response. The man left, leaving the bewildered girl alone with his son. She still didn't know how to approach the hostile invalid. Please leave, he said softly. Sheila instinctively felt it was better not to disturb him right now. She descended the stairs to the living room where Keith was sitting. So, is he resisting? He asked. A thousand times Keith cursed himself for letting his wife and son go on that trip alone. And now, if he could, he would take all of Greg's suffering upon himself. Don't be offended. He's a good kid, but his emotional wound just can't heal, so he doesn't think about his body at all. Let me show you our plot for now. Keith built his family's house near his horse farm. He enthusiastically described to the girl the advantages of his enterprise over other breeders. He proudly showed her the huge stable, arena, and riding ground. These majestic animals immediately appealed to the girl. One in particular stood out. A white beauty nervously pawed the ground, elegantly moving her long neck and lifting her silky mane. This is our pride. Milo, Greg's favorite. They used to be inseparable. Sheila lingered in contemplation to admire the noble animals. The girl knocked on the patient's bedroom door. There was no response. She knocked louder and decisively pushed the door. The guy still didn't want to communicate. Sheila sat on a chair next to his bed and began to share her impressions of yesterday's tour. It's beautiful here. I've never seen horses so up close. It turns out they're so smart. I didn't expect that. Greg snorted without turning his head. It was clear that he wasn't particularly enjoying this conversation. Sheila continued casually. Your dad showed me Milo. She's such a beauty. Don't you want to see her? She watched his reaction closely. The guy listened, holding his breath. Greg, I'll be honest with you. You have a chance to return to a normal life, but it will require long and hard work. Milo will wait as long as it takes. Greg was touched by her words. He turned his head towards her and, for the first time, looked attentively into her huge, sincere eyes. What do I need to do? He simply asked. Both of them faced heavy work ahead. Every day, for hours, Sheila methodically massaged him. Spine stretching exercises and muscle strengthening exhausted Greg and drained his strength. Keith carried his son down to the pool for aquatic therapy. Greg's movements were laborious. His own helplessness in the presence of strangers greatly irritated him, while the excruciating pain wore him down. About two weeks passed. The progress was unnoticeable. The lower part of his body remained practically uncontrollable. At one point, Greg couldn't take it anymore. In a fit of rage, he grabbed a small vase from the nightstand and hurled it at the opposite wall. The vase shattered into numerous pieces with a clang. Sheila calmly collected the shards and said to the despairing young man, just look at how much strength you have. Now, if only you could channel that strength in the right direction. But the young man couldn't control his own emotions anymore. That's it. He shouted at Sheila. I can't do it anymore. Well, that's for you to decide whether you can or not. The girl said to him and left the room with an unperturbed look. An idea had formed in her mind, but she would need Keith's help for it. She left the house and headed to the factory. Greg lay there, staring at the ceiling. Sad thoughts tormented him. How long had he been lying like this? How much longer would he have to stare at this ceiling? He no longer had the strength to recount the events of the past year. The terrible accident the sudden pain in his body and the inability to move, the dreadful news of his mother's death. 
then the hospital room, and Lauren telling him about her decision to leave, and then this room. Every morning, he didn't want to open his eyes and once again realized that nothing had changed in his life. His father, of course, was worried, although he didn't show it, bringing doctors periodically, but they all indifferently repeated the same thing. With the arrival of this girl in the house, someone who cared about what he felt, he felt hope, but his body treacherously refused to obey. Outside the window, there were some sounds. Someone knocked on the door, and Sheila entered, smiling. It's Milo, Sheila said. She's waiting for you, automatically. Greg pushed the edge of the blanket away. With a groan, he sat up and tried to put his feet on the floor. Sheila had already sprung up to offer him her shoulder and help. Some unknown force suddenly guided the boy. The girl was ready to drag him to the window by any means necessary, but immediately felt that he, though unsteady, was standing on his own. Forgetting his weakness and feeling no pain, Greg moved towards the familiar sound and finally overcame those endless two meters. The joyful Sheila, supporting the boy, opened the window wide, and he, leaning over the windowsill, shouted to his horse, Milo, my girl. Upon hearing her owner, the horse became agitated and neighed. The happy Greg couldn't take his eyes off her. She's so smart. He said tenderly to Sheila, still not taking his eyes off the horse, and suddenly realized that he was standing just a few steps away from his bed, which had previously seemed like a prison. He understood that with willpower and the help of the fragile girl, he had finally managed to break free from captivity. Sheila, thank you. If it weren't for you, the savior shyly averted her gaze from the boy. A familiar car pulled up to the house. Catherine was delighted by the unexpected visitor, invited him in, and made tea. Keith was incredibly happy and couldn't wait to share the joyful news. Greg managed to take a few steps today. Your Sheila is simply amazing. He finally burst out. How wonderful. Catherine couldn't hide her genuine excitement. She reminds me of you during our school days. Keith said, not taking his gaze off her, his eyes reflecting tenderness and hope. The former acquaintances reminisced about their youth for a while. You know, I really liked you back then. The man suddenly confessed. I had no idea. Why didn't you tell me? She blushed. I don't know. I was young and shy, but now I'm wiser. It seems silly to hide your feelings. You could waste time and lose someone. It happened once already, and I don't want to wait for a second time. He gently took Catherine's hand in his warm palm, and it was an unexpectedly pleasant gesture for both of them. Goosebumps ran down the woman's body. You are still the same kind and cheerful girl, he whispered drawing her into his warm embrace. Catherine truly felt like she was plunged back into carefree youth. She even closed her eyes and nestled into Keith's neck, feeling so good and cozy. There was a sense of care and security emanating from him. Our worries and anxieties suddenly disappeared. Inspired by Greg's recent progress, he tirelessly exercised all day long. There were no new achievements yet, but the boy could now stand up and take a few steps with crutches. He and Sheila became friends, and one day Greg confessed how deeply his mother's death and his fiancé's betrayal had hurt him. Sheila smiled and shared her own sad story. Lately, she felt a little lighter. It seemed like it didn't happen to her. Sheila decided for herself. It all happened for the better. Thank goodness she didn't tie her fate to this family. Greg watched this extraordinary girl with admiration. So fragile, yet strong-willed. He even felt ashamed of his past whims. She had it much worse, yet she was helping other people. He wanted to hug her, hold her clothes, and protect her from all the world's troubles. Sheila was embarrassed by his candid gaze. She lowered her eyes, afraid of further displays of affection from him. She liked Greg, but the girl firmly decided not to repeat past mistakes. She no longer had the right to be frivolous because now she was responsible not only for herself. With each passing day, the patient's muscles grew stronger, his body stronger, 
and his steps more confident. The doctor, whom Keith had invited, was impressed by such rapid progress. It happens when the main cause of illness lies in the patient's thoughts. He philosophically remarked and praised Sheila for the well-chosen methodology. But now the girl felt useless. Greg no longer needed her guidance and control. She merely adjusted the program slightly. The young man was already able to descend the stairs and step out onto the porch, where Milo was brought every day at his request. The successes of her charge delighted the girl, but the growing new life inside her reminded her that it was time to focus on herself and her child. Seizing a convenient moment, Sheila informed Keith of her decision to return to the village. He looked at her sadly. You can stay here for as long as you want. I'm so grateful to you for my son. But the girl was adamant. Well then, tell Greg the news yourself. Somehow I have a feeling he won't want to let you go either. If you decide to leave, I'll drive you. Sheila packed a small suitcase and descended into the living room. There sat her former patient, silently watching her. The girl approached and smiled warmly trying to cope with the anxiety that had enveloped her. So, Greg, my mission is accomplished. From now on, you'll manage on your own. The young man came towards her and took her hand. Sheila, stay. You've given me life. I can't imagine my life without you now. His pleading gaze pierced straight into the girl's soul, but she gently freed her hand and looked him straight in the eye. Greg, in three months, I'm having a baby, so what? I need both you and your child. The young man exclaimed, you're young. You still have your whole life ahead of you. Why do you need someone else's child? Sheila resolutely took her suitcase and stepped outside. Keith opened the door of his car for her. Better to end it all right now. The girl tried to reassure herself. She didn't want to leave here. This house and its occupants had given her some of the best months of her life since her father passed away. She cried all the way back to the village. Sheila tried to control her emotions, but it was all in vain. Keith was unusually silent and gloomy. Entering her childhood home, Sheila rushed into her mother's arms. Mama, I don't know what to do. Tears streamed down the girl's face, preventing her from speaking properly. Catherine understood everything without words. She hugged her daughter, trying to comfort her. Their everyday life in the village began. The old family home no longer seemed as hostile as it did after their father's death. The girl now felt loved, cared for, and always welcomed here. With age and experience came her understanding and gratitude towards her mother for all her hard work. Frances called her occasionally, sharing the latest news. She had finally enrolled in university and matured a bit. She found true love, not in another nightclub, but in a classroom. Now she was actively preparing for her wedding. Oh, by the way, she suddenly remembered in one of the conversations, your mom is an amazing woman. It turns out she gave such a speech at Patrick's wedding. Someone from the guests posted a video of her speech online. Now no one wants to associate with them. Patrick's wife filed for divorce, and her father, it turns out, was their business partner. So, the family business has declined. Not that Sheila was happy about someone else's misfortune, but she still thought there is some justice in the world. Only two weeks had passed since her return to her childhood home, but thoughts of Greg still troubled the girl. The gentle touch of his hand and his sad farewell look refused to be forgotten. Sometimes she regretted being scared, but then she convinced herself that she had done the right thing. Greg would suffer a little and forget about her, living a new and happy life, unburdened by other people's problems. The first snow fell outside. There was some noise outside, and her mother entered, bringing in a bit of the chilly air from outside. Her eyes sparkled with excitement, and she struggled to suppress her smile. Sheila, get dressed. I need your help outside. The girl was surprised, but obediently followed her outside. There was some noise from the street. Sheila approached the gate, where her mother was waiting. Suddenly she noticed Keith's car. Then the girl finally noticed where the strange sound was coming from. Straight toward her, 
with its mane blowing in the wind. A white horse galloped, kicking up chunks of snow like splashes. This mesmerizing scene so captivated the girl that she didn't immediately notice the rider. They stopped near Sheila, and she finally recognized Greg. He took a huge bouquet of roses from his father's hands and, approaching the girl, got down on one knee. Sheila, I love you very much and can't live without you. Will you marry me? He looked at Sheila tenderly and added, I legally await the arrival of our little one. Such a spectacular and sincere proposal took the girl's breath away. Greg's bright, love-filled eyes suddenly reminded her of a guise from the past. Only her dad once looked at her like that. All her doubts vanished instantly. She passionately kissed Greg on the lips. Catherine and Keith no longer hid their relationship. They stood, embracing, enjoying this beautiful fairy tale created by an ordinary person for his beloved.